Uh, excellencies, uh, a good morning uh, to all of you, uh, and a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our online audience. I am Zed Rad Al Hussein, the president of the International Peace Institute, and it is my great pleasure to welcome today to IPI His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta of the Republic of Kenya. For this uh, event, a conversation under our Global Leaders series. The theme of the conversation I will hold with the President will be leadership in implementing our common agenda, the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda. As is uh, normal with these uh, series, I will invite the President to address the online audience and the assembled ambassadors here and uh, we will then proceed to our conversation. Uh, the president uh, following this event will preside over a high-level event uh, at the UN Security Council, and so for the next few hours, he will be a double president, immensely powerful, and we hope you will solve all our problems this morning, <laughs> Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, could I now invite you to say a few words to the ambassadors assembled here, and to our online audience. And once again, we're delighted to see you with, uh, with us at IPI. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Prince Zaid, Rad Al Hussein, Your Excellency Ambassadors. Let me first and foremost begin by thanking you and your capacity as President and CEO of the International Peace Institute for this invitation. And to say that I also welcome all those who managed to find time to come out this morning and also the many who are out there following us on the internet. Let me begin by saying that uh, Antonio Guterres in his September report on our common agenda observed, and I quote, that humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, and that was breakdown or breakthrough. The Secretary General regretted the presence in stability of multilateral institutions to deliver bold solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic, to issues related to climate change, sustainable development, and protracted conflicts across the globe. The ongoing failure to deliver COVID-19 vaccines to the global population is the latest and most prominent evidence of the weakness of our existing multilateralism. Even faced with a profound common threat, old hierarchies have re-established themselves. The zero-thumb thinking fails to appreciate the simple fact that for any of us to be safe, all of us have to be safe. And this is a problem for our globe. If we continue to display the same attitude in our pursuit to overcoming the effects of climate change and biodiversity loss, the results will undoubtedly be disastrous. From where we sit, we need a new global multilateralism that puts global Africa at its heart. And we are, if we are to respond adequately to the Secretary's general call for meaningful change, we need to do so urgently. Many of the actions that are currently powering Kenya's foreign policy in the last few years have reflected our desire as a country to lead in re-energizing and redirecting multilateralism and ensuring that Africa takes its place, not merely as a recipient of aid, but as a critical actor in de delivering solutions to our world. Africa, ladies and gentlemen, is global. There are almost two billion people of African descent in the world. They live on multiple continents, and unfortunately for reasons of history, often share a similar experience of exclusion from the fruits of global industry, trade, and investment. 
We have the youngest population in the world. And one way or another, this population will travel. It will travel to all corners of the world. And this travel will either be a desperate search for employment and safety, or as a financially able tourist seeking to enjoy the world's attractions. Today, the mobile phone in each of our pockets, the electric car that we say is the future, and rechargeable batteries, the jewelries that we wear, and so many other important products could not be made except for Africa's resources. Today, most developed economies in manufacturing, medical technology, and energy development need Africa's resources as a core component of their economic production. Let me clarify just why it is so important for the world to wake up and listen to Africa and rebuild multilateralism to be inclusive, fair, but most importantly, consistent. The challenge of the modern African experience has existed for over 500 centuries. It was born of the experience of slavery and colonialism and its residual effects in our families, communities, and in most of our countries. However, the idea of the global Africa that I wish to propose today is one that we need to build. It will reconnect and re-engage with African peoples, wherever they are on our planet, and indeed also connect with all people of goodwill in a common enterprise of uplift, dignity, and independence. Global Africa embraces the philosophical ideals of what we call Negritude Harambe, Ujamaa, Ubuntu, and politically, it is the abolitionist movement, the Pan-African Congress, the anti-colonial and civil rights movement, and the African Renaissance. Pan-Africanist advocates of these ideas and movements have been urging for change in global relations for over a century. When they have not been heeded, humanity in one way or another has suffered. At the turn of the 20th century, they warned about entrenching, the entrenching of racist thinking and the fake science that powered it. They argued it degraded humanity and created systems of oppression and exploitation that were intolerable. They identified the lack of freedom and equity between peoples as a danger to the world. Unfortunately, too few paid heed to them. As a result, fascism rose unimpeded until it reached its most radical and violent expression in Nazism and the explosion of the Second World War, where tens of millions were killed in war, including the unfortunate tragedy of the Holocaust. When the Pan-Africanists next warned that decolonization needed to be genuinely free, the colonies were not paid the attention that they deserved. Today, the world continues to live with a tragic leg legacy of that incomplete decolonization. The Security Council today, as a result, spends the majority of its time discussing conflicts in Africa. Often, if not in every instance, one of the root causes of such conflicts is how decolonization was poorly undertaken over half a century ago. So today's Pan-Africanists, of which I am proud to call myself one, are calling for multilateralism to urgently respond adequately to the issues of today, to address itself to climate change, biodiversity loss, as well as the multiple protracted security challenges that we face. 
as I said, we need a new multilateralism with global Africa at its heart. It will reject discrimination and racism as part of our way of doing business. The problems that we face today are far too serious, our future far too important to leave out any country, no matter its size, to leave out any race, and for that matter, to leave out any gender. We all need to have a stake in the solutions that humanity is yearning for today. So I propose that we embrace this new understanding and build on it. And next month at COP26, being one such forum in Glasgow, we are supposed to negotiate the scale of commitments and targets to set. What should power these negotiations, I believe, is the ambition to provide Africa and the broader developing world with a viable path to rapid industrialization as part of our global journey to net zero. The failure to do so is too grim to contemplate. Today's political and economic refugee flows across our borders will be tiny by comparison to what will happen if we fail to act today. Seizing this moment, on the other hand, will have major benefits for all of humanity. Take, for instance, the green industrial park that Kenya is developing in the outskirts of a town called Naivasha, where we have over 10,000 acres to house manufacturing concerns that will almost entirely be powered by green geothermal energy. They will be connected to an efficient port by railway infrastructure. And companies that take advantage of the opportunity will be making an important contribution, not only to the development of our country, but also to their regulatory and ethical drive to achieve net zero. Kenyans will benefit from decent employment and rising prosperity. And our continent, and indeed the entire global south, are filled with such opportunities. As many of the workers in the wealthiest economies age, their retirement needs require higher returns in order for developed countries to be able to afford them. Africa, its young population, and its need to develop is a logical investment choice to earn these returns. That will happen when there is a wider appreciation by the wealthiest that Africa is not a zone for unjust exploitation, but instead it is a potential engine for immense mutual benefit to all its investors. The new multilateralism will need to embrace such enlightened self-interest rather than the failed approaches of past thinking of aid as a one-sided benefit. So ladies and gentlemen, we are in the Security Council giving voice to this plan. Our actions are guided by enabling Africa's voice and inter interests to be a primary actor in solving our security challenges not just for Africa's sake, but for the sake of our African diaspora and indeed the global south. In early September of this year, I hosted the first Africa CARICOM Summit. This historic meeting reflected the consciousness of the global Africa. We made commitments to work together for the benefit of our people and our world. Indeed, just last Sunday, I flew to New York from Barbados, where I handed over the chairing of the UN Conference on Trade and Development to the Prime Minister of Barbados. On the sidelines of that meeting, I met leaders from the Caribbean, and we all expressed deep concern about the challenges that Haiti is facing. 
And we all believe that we need to do more than empathize from a distance. Haiti happens to be one of the situations in the Security Council whose multiple crises concern Kenya the most. As part of the Caribbean, Haiti is part of the Africa's, African Union's sixth region. We are joined by bonds of ancestry and a cultural heritage. So we all feel that it is our duty to demonstrate our solidarity in the same way we did early in the year by enabling global vaccine procurement for the Caribbean countries in ways that were unimaginable in pre-COVID times. Through the African state-driven AU Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust, we have been able to offer Caribbean countries the benefit of Africa's economies of scale in pricing and procurement. Motivated by the same consciousness of a global Africa, I look forward to soon facilitating a meeting that will assemble Haiti, Africa, CARICOM, and other global partners to demonstrate practical solidarity for the people of Haiti in line with their own priorities. As we start, we will start later this week on the 15th with the A3 plus one hosting an ARIA formula meeting on Haiti that will seek Pan-African solutions and pathways to support national dialogue and reconciliation. And even as we begin, we want to demonstrate through our actions that outstretched hand of that outstretched hand of global Africa. And to this end, my administration is crafting a training and capacity building program for Haiti. And we will commit to offering 2,000 places for Haitians in our military, police, nursing, teaching, government administration, and criminal justice training institutions. We will seek partners to help co-finance these opportunities. Haitians clearly need more than emergency and humanitarian assistance. They need sustainable development assistance in order for them to come out of their current problems. I also urge the Security Council to take steps to strengthen the mandate of the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti so that it is fit for purpose. Indeed, yesterday in my meeting with the Secretary General, I urged him to take every available step to escalate the development support to Haiti. So ladies and gentlemen, as I bring my speech to an end, in order to have time to respond to some of your questions, I hope what I have tried to outline in these few minutes is a new way of working together globally and arguing that embracing thinking and consciousness of global Africa can make a difference in facing today's challenges wherever they may occur. And that is why I urge you to reposition Africa and its diaspora in your imaginations, if we are truly to bring a new multilateralism to life. Unity on the national and global level is what will enable us to bring peace and prosperity in the world. This is what has inspired my promotion of the idea of the global Africa an idea whose time, I truly believe, has come. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Mr. President, first of all, I thank you for outlining your thinking, your proposals, not just for uh, the globe in the context of the common agenda, the Secretary General's common agenda, but Africa's positioning within it. Uh, when we look at the common agenda, there are proposals being presented across 12 commitments. And in the analytical part of it, uh, one senses it is shorthand for the fragility of it all, the global fragility that we are now experiencing. 
you will shortly be presiding over the high-level debate in the UN Security Council uh, on a theme of di diversity, state building, and peace. Uh, my question to you is, why is it in so many countries, too many countries, global north, in the global north, and in the global south, that national identity is so fragile, so prone to seemingly the stronger localist influences of kin, ethnicity, tribe, religious, linguistic affiliation, skin color. Um, I'm sure you have, because you're an extremely thoughtful head of state, you have some opinions on this. And, and if you could share a snippet of what you might be saying uh, in the Security Council, we'd be grateful. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, and I think just going back to even what we were just talking about today, talking about what uh, the Secretary General has laid out as an overall agenda, what indeed is the problem? The problem, I believe, is the issue of inequity. Inequity across borders, inequity within borders. And I believe this is what has given the greatest rise in terms of extreme positions that have become the norm, as you say, the growing nationalism, the growing uh, um, ethnicization of politics. This has been critical. I believe the second part has to also do with lack of inclusion people feeling that they have not been included in mainstream thinking and in mainstream development. So equity, exclusion, I believe are the key drivers that have resulted in this fragility. Mm. And unfortunately the last I believe is also equally ignorance. Ignorance because you feel that if you look after yourself, you have resolved the problem. And we have seen this, for example, in, 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 in the kind of thinking that has uh, um, revolved around vaccine nationalism. Forgetting that with a interconnected world, no matter which way you go, Nobody in this globe is going to be safe until everybody is safe. And therefore the principle of equity in terms of distribution and access to financing is just as important to the global north as it is to the global south. And it, and, and it is not possible for you to isolate yourself, vaccinate yourself, then think and consider yourself to be safe if you haven't brought on board the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah? And, 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 and I think that is also equally a great contributor. So if we deal with just that issue of, I believe, of, of, of equity and understanding that we need the multilateral system to work not just for some of us, but for all of us, and to work in a manner that also results in people feeling included in that shared prosperity and uh, 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 shared opportunity, I believe we would be a much stronger, bolder, safer world than the current direction that we've taken. Yeah. And that applies whether you look at climate change, whether you look at protecting our biodiversity, whether you, you look at conflicts within countries, or between countries. Yes. Those principles are the ones that I believe strongly need to be addressed. So if you could permit me to pivot off the very remark you just made and look, first of all, at the internal uh, condition. And this is not, we're not speaking here of Kenya, but any state in such a uh, position. The Secretary General, in his first proposal under the first commitment, speaks of the need for states to rewrite the social contract. And I think he was thinking broad. Most states have polarized societies in the global north, in the global south, 
people the world over, and you have pointed to this in the context of climate change, feel their governments don't represent their best interests. So the Secretary General doesn't also propose how the social contracts should be written. Uh, in thinking of the how, what would you propose to the Secretary General as to what is the best way for states to approach this? I think the first is to acknowledge there is uh, no one-size-fits-all uh, uh, um, situation, that there, that there is no one formula that is going to be put in place that will redefine or fix the problems. We have to look at each situation within its own respective context. And, 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 and I, I don't want to talk about other countries, but let me use my own country as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example, where we have, over the years, transitioned from a one-party state to a multi-party state almost now, I think, 30 years uh, ago, when we went through our transition. The idea being that by creating greater democratic space, by allowing more political parties, that that would be a panacea. Uh, only for us to realize that the panacea is not, it, it wasn't just in itself a panacea. Yeah. Because, you know, we had other issues that we needed to take on board. We had issues of ethnicity. And, and, and competition between ethnic communities that would not necessarily be solved through traditional uh, 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 democratic institutions. Let's go to the poll and cast a ballot. I win, you wait. No, because that, in some instances, for example, Kenya, led to the feeling that there was a winner take all. So that if you entered into an election, you went into that election with a view of winning, and if you didn't win, there was tension and rising hostility. To us understanding that, look, this can't continue. We need to be able to embrace one another, mm. to embrace one another while at the same time allowing for diversity in our politics. Mm. But that diversity, not to the extent of tearing at the fabric, of what is our Kenyan nation. So by being inclusive, by reaching out, by not having a winner-take-all scenario, but by saying, OK, despite the fact that you've been into a competitive election, I need to also be able to reach out and include. Until such time as our society fully develops to be fully integrated to the extent that ethnicity no longer features as, 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 as an issue in, 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 in the national debate. That even if indeed what should actually feature is our cultural diversity and our ability to celebrate that cultural diversity, but not that ethnicity to disintegrate the fabric of the nation. So we, and this is what we called our... our in Kenya, we call it our handshake of, mm. of reaching out, despite the fact mm. that there were those who won and there were those who lost, recognizing mm. that in our particular situation, there can never be winners and losers. Yes. We need to be able to find a system that incorporates everybody yes. so that that element of inclusivity yeah, is felt, that element of everybody participating is felt. So this to me is, 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 is what I'm saying. There is no one remedy of saying that, yes, if you move to become a democracy, all of a sudden that is going to just change the world. No. We have to look at each country, look at its circumstances, look at its history, look at the, the, the factors that are at play, and be able to see how we incorporate those to the greatest extent possible to achieve those three things that I had said yes. of inclusion, 
yes. equity, yes. and a sense, you know, of being, of belonging. Of belonging. Of belonging. Yeah. What you're saying speaks very much to my mind. I, I come from Jordan. Mm. Uh, we are connected by the Great Rift Valley, mm. uh, so we're at the northern tip. Uh, Post-independence, uh, as we tri tried and endeavored uh, to build the modern state, we recognized we had to also detribalize the state, that uh, our tribal uh, societal makeup is valued and the traditions are valued, but in the operations of the state, they had to be diminished because otherwise the state wouldn't function. Um, and I, I can say, I think quite fairly, that we got halfway. Mm -hmm. We couldn't achieve what we wanted to, and we can't go backwards. And I think what you're saying is, how does one achieve this balance almost between preserving the character, but not at the, at the uh, expense of the operations of the mm -hmm. state? If I could stick with Kenya for one moment. Um, uh, the courts delivered uh, a rather sharp verdict on the Building Bridges Initiative, which you presented, but not on the substance, mm -hmm. uh, on the technical aspects of it. Um, it had many supporters in Kenya, and there were some detractors as well. The detractors say that uh, the one aspect of the nine points missing was a sort of the retrospective going back in time. Um, which was present in the uh, Kenya National Dialogue and Reconciliation, Article 4. This is difficult for almost every country. Every country finds it difficult to go back in time. Um, I speak as a historian, and I recognize that. I see it in my own country, my own region, in Asia. Uh, is there a way, do you think, that all of us collectively can recognize that we have many things to be proud about as humans, as nationals of our countries, and that we need in a very sort of careful way, technical way, not politicized, not to sort of begin a deeper look into each country's past, whether in, in the United States, in the history of racism, uh, slavery certainly, Europe filled with ghosts that they haven't been able to disentangle, and the rest of us also, also unable in one way to. Is that a, a fair point, do you think, Mr. President? It, 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 it is without a doubt a fair point, because uh, unless you, you, you somehow settle that path, all right, it will always live to haunt you in the future. And unfortunately, it is generational. Uh, yeah. It is generational. It's past. Uh, and, and, and it has to be dealt with. But again, there is no one formula that fits all. And I believe every country, every society, has to find its way of reconciling itself yeah. you know, with its past. Yeah. We've seen recently... Uh, uh, um, the offer, for example, by Germany to reconcile itself with its past in Namibia. Yeah. Um, some have accepted, as that is a, a, a way forward. Others have rejected it. Uh, th th there, is, there is need for them to find amongst themselves you know, a common uh, uh, position to, 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 to be able to deal with those past injustices, but to deal with it in a manner that, that does not also Con co complicate or, or, or stall yeah. the possibility of making of making of making future of making future progress. Yeah. I, for example, in Kenya, as you said, in the context of Kenya, how I am looking at it from the point of view of uh, severally at at uh, uh, um, um, state of the nation addresses or or or, or um, at our public functions. Basically saying, well, you know, I take responsibility yes. for that past. Yes. I apologize for that past, despite the fact that some of those things have happened when I was not even born. Yes. But, but, but as, as a way of saying we want to take that responsibility and, 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 and calm it, 
in order for us to be able to move forward. I'm, 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 I'm working and, and, and soon uh, we'll, we'll be, we'll be uh, presenting something you know, that, that will be out there, that, that will acknowledge yes. Kenya's history. Yes. It's good. Yes. It's bad. Yes. It's ugly. Yeah? Uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of, 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 of creating restitution, you know, because um, there are different ways of doing it. You know, we, 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 have, we have to look at that and say, okay, this we do in recognition, like I said, of the great things that Kenya has done. That's right. That's right. In recognition of the bad things that we have done. And also in accepting the ugly things that have been passed of, of, our, of, our, of, our, of, of our life, of our society, yes. yeah? Yes. But by acknowledging them, yes. really just appealing to our people to say, okay, now let's move on, yeah? That's right. Let us be pupils That's right. of our history, yeah? As opposed to people who live in our history. Let us be pupils to ensure that whatever it is we do from here going forward, we always have this stark reminder of the things that we did wrong to keep us on the straight and narrow and to ensure that we never go back yes. Yeah? Yes. to those days. So every country, I believe, needs to look at it from their own perspective. You, you touch on, and I'll, I'll just also mention this, because I um, discovered not too long ago and here I was, uh, the former UN human rights chief, that my grandfather may have committed an atrocity in 1920, on July the 20th in 1920 in, in Damascus. The details are sketchy, and, but it seems he took a machine gun and shot at a large group of people. Uh, I only discovered this a year ago. Extremely painful to think that a man who I thought was gentle could have been involved in something like this. But I have to recognize, if it's true, I have to recognize right. he should have been prosecuted. And as you correctly point out, guilt uh, doesn't transfer under law from one generation to another, but a commitment to restitution where possible, remedy where possible, and never do it again, I think is the point that you... That's precisely the direction I, 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 I seek to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Could I take you to the, the long uh, series of points that you raised? Um, the common agenda suggests that there is a common problem. I have a very, uh, I'm going to lead you in questioning here, so please forgive me. <laughs> you might think it's, but you know, I'm, I'm new to interviewing, so I allow, <laughs> allow myself. My, my sense is, Mr. President, that we have a, in, in the world today, we have a soft regulator called the UN. Uh, most of the treaties our countries sign and ratify are deposited here. It's the repository of most of these treaties. And the Secretary General is there to remind us of the obligations that we have uh, signed up to, the norms, whether it be on trade, or the rules, whether it be on trade, or uh, the, the way in which we interact. My sense is, and please tell me I'm wrong, because I may well be, that what we have now, it's almost like a football match with a referee mm -hmm. who has a whistle. And as we know, in the big leagues in Europe, all the money is with the clubs, it's with the star players, the referee, no one knows who the referee is. They're, goes home, we don't know their names. But when the game is played, they decide the game. Mm -hmm. They decide the points, they decide the the violations, infractions, and so forth. Uh, what we have essentially is a referee whom few people are paying any attention to. Okay. You are supporting the common agenda. You've come through with these proposals on Haiti. You're thinking altruistically. You want the world to think altruistically. But is it a fair point that many other heads of states and governments are simply almost ignoring the UN? and not paying attention to the referee. And in, in effect, almost too powerful. The players are too powerful and the referee is blowing the whistle, warning us of, of the calamities Benjamin. to come, unless we do something, yeah. Is that a fair point? 
I would say it is a fair point, and it, and it, it is a fair point, and that is why we're saying the multilateral system isn't working fairly for all of us. Um, and, 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 and this lack of recognition that we need uh, a level playing field, yeah. that we need a referee who uh, uh, stands and, 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 and corrects and makes sure that the game and the, 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 the playing field, like I said, is level. So that everybody feels that whatever the outcome, whichever club has won, yes. it was done in a free, transparent and fair mode and you are able to accept those results. But that unfortunately is not the situation. We all were there right from the very beginning when we talked about uh, uh, vaccines. We all know the commitments that we made uh, to that. I tell people that Africa has never been as prepared as it was this time to face a pandemic. But yet, despite all the preparations that we made, despite working with global partners to develop COVAX, to develop all these things that we developed, when the vaccine eventually was made available and found, it wasn't distributed in accordance with what we said. Yes. Yeah? And we found that there were those who kept it to themselves yeah? without care of what we had all previously agreed on. We went through and we have had G7 meetings, we have had G20 meetings, all committing that uh, the, 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 the pandemic has created uh, uh, a huge problem, especially for the developing countries and the need to be able to, su to support them uh, through all these various debt relief initiatives in order to be able to release resources that can be applied to the pandemic. Whereas we are grateful that we have had some relief it is nowhere near what many of us expected. Yeah. We had the IMF thinking out of the box for the first time, and that is something some of us truly appreciate. Thinking out of the box, how can we support these countries? We had then the issue of the special drawing rights. Here we are. We've agreed that we want to, to be able to have these additional special drawing rights in order to assist the most vulnerable. But when we have gone through, approved it, we only get a portion. And yet countries that don't need them are not willing to release yes. that which has been available to them to those who really need it. Yes. Right? Yes. So yes, we appreciate the extent of support. We, because there has been some. It's like an acknowledgment. Right? But where are we uh, in terms of giving it to the degree that it is required. And the same applies also to climate change. Yes. We all are very familiar. I was a participant in Paris, huh, where huge, huge commitments were made, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation. But where are the resources that were supposed to be made available to help countries like ours adapt? Yes. To date, yes. not available. We are now going to, to Glasgow yes. to listen to new pledges. Yet the old ones yes. have yet to be fulfilled. This tells you yes. that we do have a system where, despite the fact that we agree on things, this multilateral system isn't being played on what you call a level playing field. playing field. Well, there's almost a sense of abandonment that we are approaching some point in time where we become lifeboat Earth. And we either capsize the boat very quickly because we're all fighting, or we work together to keep the boat afloat and survive as a, as a human race on this tiny little ball. Mm. And on uh, the climate change, I mean, uh, there are two things here. One, I, one is the pandemic. I, I'm surprised that there is no thinking about an 
a sort of economic compensatory scheme in the future for any country that is told they have to lock down because there's a new pathogen. You, the rules should be very clear. You should be able to access capital markets at zero interest, not 5%. Uh, otherwise, what's the incentive to close your economy down if, and, and suffer while no one else is well, paying your attention? That's why I said that is where the IMF was heading. That's why we had the additional right. special drawing rights. That's right. That's right. So yes, we got a part of it. That's right. But did we, did we didn't get what was required for That's us right. to be able That's right. to fulfill the obligations that we were supposed to fulfill in order to contain the pandemic. That's right. And that is why you find countries opening up earlier than they should because they have to find a way That's right. of being able to support their respective societies. Mr. President, speaking about uh, COP26, and you spoke about the low ambition, and indeed this was a theme that emerged from Madrid and Greta Thunberg and the youth of this globe is constantly telling us we're low on ambition. Kenya is particularly prone in terms of its climate. You're pushing hard for green investment, mm. green manufacturing in Kenya. Could you tell us something about this, uh, what your thinking is uh, on this? Really what we're saying is that Resources are available. Commitments have been made, for example, in terms of mitigation, be it in most of the developing world. And what we are saying is that why can't some of those be utilized in countries like Kenya for adaptation? We have an abundance of resource, for example, like I said, of geothermal, yeah. right? Uh, that is green, clean energy. We're not even saying give us this money so that for free. We're saying we want you to make investments that have positive return. But through those investments, help us all reduce emissions, which is our common yes. target, yes. but also in the process, support our economies yeah to create opportunities and prosperity, which ultimately feeds into preventing the kind of migration that we're seeing. Yeah. So you, you, you com a let's circular, com let's a circular complete economy. This, the circle, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Let's complete this circle, yeah. right? Rather than looking and thinking you can sort, you know, your problem, and that's somebody else's problem. It's our problem. Yes. And the solution lies in working together, right? Yeah. But you can't say, well, you know, I'm solving mine, because you will never solve yours unless you... Yes, the, the, the same principle we applied when we talked vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. No one is safe until everyone Everybody is safe. safe. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. They, they will not be future prosperity, security and safety until everybody... Yes. Is safe. ...has that and is safe. Yes. And, and prosperous. Uh, and that's why I said you can have two kinds of tourists. Yes. You can have the migrant who is coming to look for jobs and to look for opportunity outside, or you can have that person coming uh, yes. to be a contributor to the global economy. To the global economy. Yeah, Mr. President, you are heading to the Security Council in a few moments, so a, a geopolitical question, if I may. Uh, Many of us come from countries that have excellent relations with both the United States and with China. Is there a danger as the geopolitical tensions between these two countries that almost dominate the global economy, as those tensions continue, is there a danger that the rest of us, uh, to use and borrow a celebrated African uh, metaphor, are the grass over which the two elephants, the elephants will, will trample. Yes. Without a doubt, there is that danger, and there is, is that. And, 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 and I believe that we, we, we need to find a situation that uh, does not lead us to that kind of confrontation. Uh, and one of the issues, not only Kenya, but most African countries find themselves in, is your asks. To, to slot yourself on one side or another. And yet we don't want to slot ourselves on anybody's side. We want to slot ourselves on our own side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
We want, we want to be on our own side and our own interest, which I believe can adequately be catered for if we had a fair global trade and investment arrangement for everybody. Right? Yes. And, 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 and so, yes, indeed, there is a threat to all of us, as always, as you just said, when two elephants yes. fight, it is the grass that suffers. It suffers. I if this scenario continues, unfortunately, it will be global trade yes. uh, that will suffer. It will be the smaller countries that will suffer. And it is our hope that we can all have that much greater faith and trust yeah, in our multilateral institutions to be able to play a level, to create that level playing field, going back to exactly what we said, so that there are no winners and losers and we can all end up you know, being winners instead of being slotted uh, into various uh, uh, um, um, uh, pockets. We, we want to be in, in our own. We want, we want to succeed and we want to be able to deal with the world yeah. and service the interests of our people and our respective regions. Yes. You know, I, when I served in the Security Council, there was one meeting where the Americans and the Russians were, were fighting. I mean, it was very severe exchange of words. And the rest of us were in the middle trying to find language that would calm the situation. The Americans insisted that we side with them completely. So I spoke to my minister and I said, Minister, what would you have me do? They're, they're fighting and we're trying to help uh, calm it down. And he said, well, if the Americans are asking, OK, side with the Americans, but don't upset the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Just the sort of thing that uh, one can experience. Mr. President, we've reached almost the end of our time. Uh, two final questions, personal questions. Uh, looking now for the, uh, the, sort of, uh, the last few months of your tenure as president of the Republic of Kenya, what do you see as your, uh, as your main legacy in terms of what you, you leave for the country? And, uh, and what are you going to do next uh, once you've left office? For me, the main would be what I think we have done in terms of uh, um, bringing our people were much closer together than they have ever been uh, really and being able to reduce and remove some of the intentions that have existed in local politics. It has been as a result of that I believe that a lot of the infrastructure across the country that we've been able to achieve focus ourselves on and, and, and the kind of development that we have achieved through devolution in our own country. Seeing hospitals grow, access to electricity, access to roads, access to clean water, new opportunities as a result of the investments that we've made in the digital world, uh, creating online jobs for many millions across our country, and internationally being in a position to have, I think, set Kenya on a different a stage and level in terms of our global, of our global engagement, in terms of uh, what we shall do. We shall talk about that on another stage, on another day. <laughs> <laughs> President Kenyatta, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.